we present the news quiz with your host, Miles Jupp. Hello, and welcome to the news quiz. We start with a cutting from the film section of The Guardian, read by Corrie Caulfield. With Leonardo DiCaprio currently facing a close encounter with a bear in the film The Revenant, Graham Virtue recalls other films where animals are successfully beaten off. <laughs> uh, thanks to mucky-minded Hugh Lawton in Oxfordshire for choosing to get involved in that way. Now, let's meet the teams. Will you welcome first on my right, Susan Kalman and Michael Deacon. <laughs> and opposite them, on my left, Zoe Lyons and Andrew Maxwell. <laughs> Susan, who wants to negotiate a little less unity? David Cameron is the short answer to that. Uh, the longer answer is we can start being positive and joyous about the upcoming European referendum because David Cameron has arrived triumphant, clutching a letter from Mr Tusk. And I like the fact they've kind of sent letters to each other. It's quite old-fashioned that they've done that. Um, about Europe. And uh, we've all been holding back, I think, the joy that we all feel about the upcoming referendum. And what I'm saying is, I let it go, everyone. Let it spout out of you. <laughs> but the problem is, it's not really achieved the aims some wanted. So in the manifesto, Conservative Party manifesto, David Cameron made a number of pledges, and the letter that's come back uh, falls short, some would say. Um, if you think of Europe like a Chinese restaurant, and, and half of your group of friends don't like uh, Chinese food, he's gone, I'm going to sort it all out. Don't worry, I'll sort it all out. And then he's gone up to the bar and he's moved a coaster a bit. <laughs> uh, does anyone know where he announced uh, his progress so far? He was, in, he was doing one of those factory things with his shirt sleeves mm, rolled yeah. up that, that politicians do when they want to look manly. I, I was there, actually. It was in... Um, so he's, he's announcing his, his big news, his huge victory, and you would think, well... Where do you announce that? At the House of Commons, so that our elected representatives can question him about it. And in fact, he was about 75 miles away in Wiltshire. And this is just to show you that David Cameron is totally open-minded about possibly leaving the EU, and he's not trying to influence anyone here at all. He, he, get, he made his big announcement at the office of a German company whose <laughs> boss supports the EU, and in fact introduced Cameron's speech um, by telling him to get the referendum over with as soon as possible so that we can all reunite with Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have loved it if he delivered it in Esperanto as well. That would have been... Yeah, he should have worn a costume or something. He should, should have joined in a little bit. He always looks he? very sort of unsettled in those places, like a sort of unhappily married sales rep killing time in a costa or something like that. <laughs> 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 the best ones he does is when he does some um, speeches in factories or warehouses, because then he's confronted by an audience entirely of working-class men, and you can see the fear in his eyes. <laughs> and he does something very different from them that he doesn't do at, say, a Tory party conference or an audience of businessmen. He always starts his speeches in factories or warehouses with a joke about association football. <laughs> <laughs> because you can see the thinking, what, what does the common man like? Uh, he likes the soccer, Prime Minister. <laughs> I see. Wh which team do I support again? <laughs> Upton Villa, I think. <laughs> I've heard that he's uh, smooth as an eel. Is that true? I, I've, like, I mean, I've never actually... I've never caressed body him. Body hair-wise. <laughs> yeah, body hair-wise. I've heard that, like... Oh, you should see him moving through the water. <laughs> I was listening to somebody, a, a political cartoonist, talking about having actually met him and was being astonished by his physical smoothness. <laughs> oh, I know this is this is this is Steve Bell of the Guardian, who always sort of emphasises Cameron's smoothness by drawing him with a massive condom pulled tight over yeah. his head. <laughs> time he actually yeah, he, he bumped into Cameron at a conference and Cameron gripped him by the arm and so you could tell immediately he's not really all that delighted with this particular he just slipped off <laughs> and uh, he said to him uh, Steve yes it's it's very funny uh, the way you draw me like that but you know I think you can push the condom too far <laughs> To, uh, he, he's not going to stop child benefit, but child benefit will now be paid at the same amount as the person's country of origin. Uh, and bearing in mind there are 27 other members 
of the EU. That's a teeny weeny bit of paperwork he's created for himself right there. In fact, I think it's actually going to cost more to put that through than it will save. So that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of exciting wording in it. Let's take this bit. Um, the union institutions, together with the member states, will facilitate the coexistence between different perspectives within the single institutional framework, ensuring both the effective operability of union mechanisms and the equality of member states before the treaties. I mean, if that's not music to your ears, I don't know what is. <laughs> You, you take that on the campaign trail, up and down pubs in this country, everyone will be saying, that is exactly what I've been saying for years. <laughs> it's, it's all about the Germans. Everything, uh, when it comes to the European Union in this country, it all comes down to how British people feel about the Germans. And I personally love the Germans, you know? I've lived in Germany, and uh, I like them. But by God, they love a rule. And, <laughs> and not some of them some of the time, all of them all of the time. <laughs> in Germany, by law... If it's a mixed sauna, men and women steaming together, by law, a man must be naked. <laughs> <laughs> no, a man must be naked, because to a German's mind, if a man is, if there's uh, steamy female flesh and a man's in, in his swimmers, he might be hiding a sneaky bit of business. <laughs> a, sneaky, a sneaky tumescence, whatever the Radio 4 term for a hard-on is. <laughs> So, to their mind, and he, honestly, you can go into a sauna in Germany and you'll go to yourself, right, I'll wear my shorts, and when somebody complains, then I'll speak in English, they'll realise it's a cultural difference, and I mean no ill, right? I swear to God, if you walk into a sauna in Germany with your shorts on, German husbands will get up from their wives, red-faced with rage, and go, do you mind? My wife is here! <laughs> Show me your penis! <laughs> It's the law. It's the economic engine of yeah. Europe, my friends. <laughs> but it's the law in France that men have to wear speedos. That's right. Because I went to France and I was but like, I would, I would prefer it. <laughs> <laughs> I would prefer it if you were all wearing, I do not like to see it. And, well, I've avoided it for a long time, and I would rather not see it. And everyone's wearing these tight speedos, and I was like, this is disgusting. I feel, I feel, dis I am disgusted. <laughs> and uh, then, I, then I found out it was the law, because they uh -huh. think it's more hy hygienic to wear speedos. I in, find it repulsive. In a sauna? Or no, in, in a swimming pool. Oh, I was going to say, oh, some oh, speedos in a sauna that we're no. not wearing clinger film around, <laughs> just... <laughs> Equivalent shrinking effects, <laughs> wouldn't it? You know? I've lost two pounds off that little puppy. You know? <laughs> you know, you're dead right. We were saying, we was, uh, me and my teenage son, we went to a swimming pool in France last summer, right? We had our normal shorts, our God given shorts, <laughs> yes, that anybody British or Irish would wear while swimming, as the Lord intended. <laughs> feel free to strike up Jerusalem whenever you feel. <laughs> They were like, no, you can't come in. And again, like, red-faced with rage, there's a swimming pool attendant, and then they, well, we haven't got them, OK? We don't have your sexy garments. <laughs> but then they lead you back out. They forcefully lead you back out to the lobby where there is a vending machine, which would usually have crisps and Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> and there is Speedos that you've got to buy. It's so weird being a dad and your teenage son, just the two of us in a pair of sexy Speedos. <laughs> And I'll tell you, for the first half an hour, you're like, oh, this is terrible. And then after a while, you're like, yeah. No. <laughs> oh, wow. Eventually, this is the reform package which David Cameron has thrashed out in Brussels with President of the European Council and charismatic faceless bureaucrat Donald Tusk. Cameron said that he would join the European Union on the basis of this deal, following an emotional scene where he clasped Donald Tusk in his arms and whispered, you had me at protocol number 36. <laughs> David Cameron has secured measures known as the emergency break and the red card, but has been forced into a climb down on his proposed lucky dip, where if a country plays their joker during the showbiz round, they get double farming subsidies. <laughs> Cameron's achievement paves the way for the referendum and for England to be out of both the EU and the European Championships by the end of June. <laughs> Conservative MP Steve Baker said the renegotiation was like polishing a poo. It looks funny, it smells funny, and when you poke it, it's soft in the middle. <laughs> Regardless of his politics, this is a man who's clearly done his research. <laughs> Two points to Susan. Michael, which cruise took control? Uh, this is the, um, the American presidential elections, and they're still in the early stages. At the moment, they're going state by state to decide who the candidates are going to be for the Republicans and the Democrats. 
They're in Iowa, first of all, this week, and the Iowans have chosen the Republican candidate. They want, well, they want it to be Ted Cruz. And so there's tremendous sort of excitement about him at the moment. Although, I, personally, I wouldn't get carried away because, you know, just winning the first Iowa caucus, as they call it, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be the nominee in the end. I mean, if you look back, the last couple of elections, 2008 was apparently won by a guy called Mike Huckabee, and I've had a look on Wikipedia. I'm pretty sure he's not been president yet. <laughs> um, and on the Democrat side, um, it was Hillary Clinton v. Uh, Bernie Sanders, which was won in this state by uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, the result decided by the age-old democratic tradition of the coin toss. <laughs> um, I, would, I would love it if the actual presidency, <laughs> the whole campaign, were to be decided that way, although um, this being America, you know, I'm sure the lawyers would start piling in and saying, that's not fair, that's no way to decide whether a candidate is suitable for office. We demand three rounds of scissors, paper, stone. I mean... <laughs> So that's where we are at the moment. Do you think it's not, not a big deal then? It's no, it's no indicator? Or is it the start of a long, unpleasant journey? Oh, it's going to be a long, unpleasant journey, absolutely. I mean, Donald Trump is still hanging in there. <laughs> but the, the coin toss thing then, how, how does that work then? How close does it have to be before it's decided on the coin toss? Oh, they were about, I don't know, they, they were within a 1% of each it was other. 0.2% difference between the mm. two of them? But yeah. it was the person who came third in the Republican race that was the, the interesting one, this kind of moderate... Republican, because I don't think the Republican Party won either Trump yeah. or Cruz. I think the problem it's... with Trump is he's raised the bar of nuttydom so <laughs> high <Yeah>. now, <laughs> so that anybody that's even just a few millimetres underneath that bar, you go, well, Seems they seem to... quite moderate, don't yeah. they? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, you're right, Marco Rubio, he came third, who's also Cuban-American, like Cruz, but he's meant to be the moderate Republican candidate. He hasn't got a lot of depth to him. But he's very smooth. Mm. He's a smooth talker. <laughs> he's very smooth. Yeah. Oh, yes. you, you should see him through the water, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's he pushing the There's a great quote far. about Rubio, because <laughs> he has the, he's a great orator, very smooth. But there was a congressman said of Rubio recently, he goes, Oh, to see this guy speak. Old women swoon, young women faint, and toilets flush themselves. <laughs> The weird thing about it is, you know, it's this, oh, it's quite quaint, isn't it? Iowa picks the whole thing off. I mean, it's totally unbalanced, apart from the fact that Iowa is way more white, and so is uh, New Hampshire, than the rest of America. Older, whiter, uh, more church-going. If you look at it on a map, it's a perfect square of corn. That's all it is. It's a giant cornfield with Methodists in it. <laughs> Interesting to see Trump, who obviously hates to be a loser, lose, but he's passing words to Iowa. I found him slightly threatening. He was like, I love you, Iowa. I'm going to buy a farm here. <laughs> <laughs> the difference, though, I think, between the Democrats and the Republicans can be seen in the, almost in the names of them. Hillary and Bernie. Sounds like <laughs> a lovely old couple you'd meet on holiday. Whereas, you know, Trump and Cruz sounds like something old gay men do. <laughs> Does anyone, anyone know any Ted Cruz trivia? Ted Cruz trivia? He's I know that he's born in Canada. Mm. That is trivial. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he, he once cooked bacon using only a semi-automatic rifle. <laughs> there, is, there is a video of him, you can watch, you watch it on YouTube, in which he uses a semi-automatic rifle to cook bacon, just the sheer heat of it. It's Has he never heard of a George Foreman grill, for God's sake? <laughs> uh, does anyone know what anything of, any of this has got to do with Adele? Oh. Yes, she... Trump's been using her song... Which one? Someone Rolling in the like Deep. You. Rolling, so, no, it was not Rolling in the Deep. No, I think it's Someone Like You. Oh, is it Someone Like You? I don't um, know, so you two are going to have to find it out. <laughs> <laughs> someone Like You. Oh, oh no, not a song. <laughs> Gosh, she the says, temperature in here has dropped several degrees. <laughs> and she said to stop using it because That's... she doesn't want him to use it. That's right. His rallies are the only place mm. on the planet that you can go to now to get away from the... <laughs> <laughs> Sodding things. Um, <laughs> embryonically, this is the Iowa caucus, the first step for Republican and Democratic candidates on the long journey to the White House. Trump was beaten by Ted Cruz, and Hillary Clinton narrowly beat Bernie Sanders, confounding opinion pollsters who, throughout the campaign, had predicted a crushing victory for Ed Miliband. <laughs> Trump
Trump now faces a strong challenge from Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, although he pointed out if the Americans had built that wall he'd asked for, he wouldn't be facing candidates called Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. <laughs> The Democratic race between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton was incredibly close. In rare circumstances, Democrats resolve ties by flipping a silver coin. However, the practice is not used by Republicans for fear that the silver might land on their skin and burn right through it. <laughs> Two points to Michael. Zoe, who has rolled off the register? Ah, this uh, is to do with the changes in the way that we register ourselves to vote in this country. There have been changes to the electoral register, and it is now the case that you have to, people have to register themselves to vote individually. Uh, it used to be that you'd be able to uh, register an entire household at one go. Uh, now it's individually, and as a result, they, they guesstimate about 800,000 people have uh, slid off the uh, electoral register of vote. And most of those, apparently, are students, or a lot of them are students, students living in student cities. Um, because universities used to register them, um, uh, now they have to be registered individually. And, uh, and students, being students, can't be bothered, mate. Can't be bothered. I mean, we've always thought of students as a sort of bedrock of political activism. You know, yeah, we're going to make a change. We're going to change the world. We're going to change the direction of things. It's going to be a revolution. Now they've got to film out a form. They're like, oh, right, I can't be bothered with that. Sorry about that. Um, I'm too busy eating Cocoa Pops for lunch and watching back episodes of Peppa Pig. So... Um... <laughs> But now La Labour are worried because, um, uh, because uh, they think a lot of the, the voters that have been lost are actually Labour supporters, um, these students, which doesn't say a lot about Labour supporters, <laughs> does it really, if you think a vote of them can't be asked to turn up for you? I don't understand the way this story's been reported, because The Guardian stuck it on the front page and presented it as some kind of scandal, but I tend to think, you know, if you don't have the wits or organi organisational skill to fill in a form, mm. maybe it's in the country's best interest that you're not allowed to vote. <laughs> I mean, are you really the sort of person who should be allowed to choose who we put our nuclear arsenal in? You know, I, can't yeah. think, I can't even say that, but you know the point I was trying to make there. Mm. Yeah, um, WhatsApp groups are really exciting, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Like, I mean, you keep meaning to, but, like, every time you put your phone down, bing, somebody's added <laughs> yeah. another thing to it. Like, what does this mean? What are you... No. What are you... What, what's up? It's like, yeah. it's like a group text, you and all your friends, yeah. and you can give it a wacky yeah. name. Yeah, we're, I, don't, we're... I don't have any friends. Can I join your group? Yeah, I, yeah we'll definitely start It's sort of like those yeah. annoying emails where someone's organising a weekend and then everyone keeps pressing reply all, and after a while you go, Yeah, but it's, and... it's in your phone like a text. <laughs> that sounds unbearable. <laughs> Well, I'd, 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 I'd be happy to do any voiceover work they required, but it sounds absolutely unbearable. <laughs> the most interesting part of this story, though, for me, was I, just, I didn't even know that there was a shadow minister for electoral mm. registration, uh, <laughs> Gloria DePiro. And no, she's, a, she's brand new. Yeah. Is she a, a minister, Never... shadow minister for electrical... It's the job they all want, Elec it's doing. Got it's electrical registration. Wants. Yeah, that's getting me wires crossed there. <laughs> <laughs> electoral registration. <laughs> she's, she's the shadow minister for electoral registration. My God, even three large glasses of Merlot couldn't make that sound interesting <laughs> at a dinner party, <laughs> could it? Yeah. What do you do, Gloria? Well, uh, oh, I'm the shadow minister for electoral <laughs> registration. <laughs> I make students fill out forms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm changing the world, don't belittle me. <laughs> when I was a student, the one thing that they, they, they were absolutely certain about was we had to put individual TV yeah. licences in the halls of residence because they sit outside the halls of residence. They, that's the BBC, sit outside the halls of residence. I don't think they did. And you'll go to jail. That's what they said, is you'll go to jail. So, I mean, I, I paid it, obviously, because I couldn't go to jail with this sweet, sweet ass. I'd... <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It would be like, fresh meat! And I'm like, ah! <laughs> so... <laughs> so, essentially, I paid my TV lessons <laughs> out of fear of being in the Glaswegian version of Orange is the New Black. <laughs> And as a student as well, I signed at Freshers' Week. You sign, you do, you could just put it in front of them. You sign anything. Mm. Mm. For that a... one week, though, that is the only week. But Freshers get them week, in you that one. Things. You know, in the one week where everyone's terrified and no one has any friends, they'll join up to everything. Oh yeah, it's because I'm not a member of any societies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I'm still technically a member of the Glasgow University Ballroom Dancing Society <laughs> because you just go, yeah, I'll join. Please be my friend. Please be my friend. So just have a booth and pretend it's something. 
and then they sign it and then they're registered to vote. So that's trick the students. Yeah, that's Isn't what they're doing at Sheffield University. That's what they've done at Sheffield University. When students go to enrol, they automatically put a form in front of them that gets them signed up onto the electoral register, which does make it a lot easier. Don't give them food no. until they've signed. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is super boring, this story, but it is actually... It is super, du super duper boring. We've all been scratching around it, Andrew, but, but it, yes. It is, <laughs> but it, this, is, this part of it, the registration, is only the first part of it. It's to, the registration is then to see how many people are in each constituency, because the second part of the legislation, which the Tories have wanted to do during the coalition government, is, is called a, equaling the size of the constituencies, because mm -hmm. a true blue Tory constituency in the Shires is, is I think, about 140,000 people in it, whereas a, a true red Labour heartland constituency is roughly about 80,000. So on the face of it, it seems like a, a matter of fairness, make all the constituencies equal. And they think through doing that, see, my mouth is drying with the boredom of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they think they, that they'll basically, uh, it will then have an inbuilt majority for the Tories from there on in. Mm. So I think what it should be is, it should be like in Belgium, where everybody is automatically enrolled to give all their organs if they die in a car crash. And then you have to have a card on you in Belgium to say, no, I want to be buried with them. <laughs> right? And right. therefore, they have no back catalogue of people who need organs in Belgium. There's always so, loads. So you should be automatically enrolled on the register. And right. unless you go there on the day and vote for who you want to vote for, they just pick one for you. They just take your <laughs> organs. <laughs> they take your organs. They take your organs. A Belgian yeah. takes your organs <laughs> and yeah. they return you to a chocolate bar. Well, Hercule Poirot turned up with a knife. That would make me vote. Um, gruesomely, this is the news that new rules may be deterring young people and students from registering to vote. Over 800,000 people have dropped off the electoral register in the last year, either because of the new process or, and this is just as likely, due to sheer unadulterated despair. <laughs> Only 300,000 18-year-old registered to vote in the last year, while there are over a million on Facebook, where they immediately join the group, why do I feel like the helpless victim of somebody else's decisions? <laughs> I can sympathise with students ignoring correspondence about these changes. When I was at university, I wasn't interested in any post unless it was emblazoned with the words meat and feast. <laughs> the new electoral register will be used to redraw the map of the UK's constituencies, and it's thought the Conservatives will benefit from this process, with new seats expected to include Chelsea, another bit of Chelsea, a third bit of Chelsea, <laughs> and all of the North. <laughs> It's all part of the Tories' plan to do away with a piece of outdated legislation known as the Great Reform Act and return things to a much clearer system where you only have to go to the trouble of voting if you're over 35, own some land, and your name begins with the words, the Duke of. <laughs> Two points to Zoe. Andrew, what arbitrary decision have the UN made? All the UN have said today that Julian Assange is being unlawfully detained in the Ecuadorian embassy. I don't understand. <laughs> that's not how detaining people works. Yeah, you're not being kidnapped if you run down the cellar yourself. <laughs> he went into the Ecuadorian embassy. The British taxpayer, me, you, and everybody else who's listening in Radio Land, has spent a fortune having a couple of bobbies standing outside the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, the reason why he's hiding out in the Ecuadorian embassy is because he's unwilling to go to a completely fair and democratic country and answer questions about a, a certain amount of possible sex crime, which, yeah. again, I personally think is bad sport. <laughs> the, uh, the, I think it's a confusing thing. It's a PR thing to a certain extent that he's getting the United Nations to say because British policemen might arrest him on the basis of a European arrest warrant, he is in some way having his rights infringed. And that's what he's kind of alleging through this. It makes no sense. It's like me breaking into Gillian Anderson's house <laughs> and then saying I'm being arbitrarily detained, fingers crossed, because if, I... <laughs> because if I leave the house, I will be arrested for breaking into Gillian Anderson's house. So... Oh, he must be in a terrible state. Five years in a row, eating nothing but Ferrero Rocher. <laughs> I mean, it's... Don't get me wrong. There's people in worse states. I mean, I just don't get the guy. I'm not going to lie to you, right? I, I'd be as libertarian as a lot of people. In some ways, both him and Snowden, it's good that, you know, the whistleblowing 
ethics of opening up the doors. We get to find out what our governments are doing. That's good. But then if you dump millions of documents without reading them just into the ether, it's reckless. Well, what I don't understand is, fundamentally, this is a guy who is trying to avoid being locked up for years on end. And the way that he is avoiding this <laughs> is by locking himself up for years on end. It's, it's the Ecuadorian staff I feel sorry for in the embassy now, because it must... He's, I mean, that is a nightmare guest scenario, isn't it? <laughs> you know, he just popped up one day and went, look, it'll only be for a couple of weeks, I promise. <laughs> you won't even know I'm here. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll find another sofa after the... And two and a half years... They must be coming in going, uh, Julian, uh, <laughs> do you think you might be able to find somewhere else to stay at the weekend? It's just, you know, <laughs> the wife and I were planning something a little special. <laughs> Just a little strange when you're here all the time. Have you... Curled up at the end of the bed like a small Yorkshire Terrier. <laughs> Have you started looking for jobs yet, maybe? Yeah. You know, but, uh, and, I mean, the alternative is a prison in uh, Sweden, which uh, they do a lot of finger painting. <laughs> you, know, you know, you live on an island. Is that you what learn they call how... it in Sweden? <laughs> <laughs> By all accounts, Sweden is pretty independent-minded. I mean, they're right up cheek to jail with Russia, but they're not even in NATO. I don't think they can be easily pushed around. And um, that said, the Swedes are weirdos. <laughs> uh, are you about to explain Swedish sauna etiquette to us? Yes. Is this how you gauge the personality and characteristics of any nationality? True. If true you've, got, you could, oh, you've got to judge people by the way they treat a sauna. No, genuinely, in Sweden, right? This is now Sweden. You... Are you, are you... <laughs> Is this genuinely about saunas? This isn't... A, oh, well, actually, I have been, obviously, in Swedish saunas. Obviously. Oh, now, is a you just travel around the world going to saunas, Andrew? <laughs> Sweden is a really strange place, because until you go there, uh, you always assume Sweden is this incredibly liberal society, right? Whereas, in fact, they're not at all. They're, they were neutral during the Second World War, and that's because they had a 50-50 preference for both teams. They're, they're quite unusual. In Sweden, by law... Check this out. <laughs> Check this out. This gen- God's honest truth. In Sweden, by law, right? The cops... The cops go around... Naked. <laughs> by law. <laughs> if someone tries to arrest you in Sweden and they're not naked, you have to rip their clothes off before, before they're allowed to take you to a police station. Is that right? Am I right? Am I near? Yeah! <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Uh, no, in Sweden, by law... The cops go around in plain clothes in nightclubs pretending that they're high and then they go up to you and then uh, if they suspect you're high, this is by law in Sweden, they're allowed to take you away, force you to give a urine sample if you can't for whatever reason you're dehydrated or you can't get back to your kids in time. They, they're allowed to take you down the police station by law without even charge or even, they're allowed to strap you if necessary to a medical table forcefully remove blood from you, and if they find drugs within your bloodstream, they're allowed to do you for possession. <laughs> <laughs> they're it's not the rules, Sweden! Oh, if it's not in me back pocket, it's too late! This entire <laughs> night is a reason for no-one to ever go on holiday with you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> All these it. things <laughs> have clearly happened yeah. to you. <laughs> goes, oh, a bit to city break. Don't go! A <laughs> uh, very different world, of course, since Assange. What, what will be different for Assange? What will, we, what will he find shocking about our world? Now, 2012, he's been detained, mm. in his own words, not ours. Uh, Sebastian Coe is a bit less of a hero, I suppose, mm. since 2012. <laughs> I think, I think the, main thing that's, the main thing that's changed since he went in is at the time that he went in there, loads of people thought he was this brilliant, glorious rebel. <laughs> He does look very disturbing in the latest photos. He has a touch of Witherspoons about him, all right. <laughs> I don't feel sorry for him at all. I mean, look, he, he is the Twitter generation's David Icke. <laughs> <laughs> Paradoxically, a UN panel has ruled that WikiLeaks founder and ghost of Noel Edmonds, Julia Assange, <laughs> has been unlawfully detained. <laughs> The government apparently got the news of the UN decision in December, but didn't tell anyone till now, allowing Julian Assange to once more enjoy a traditional Ecuadorian Christmas. <laughs> Pacing up and down inside a box room for 24 hours, wearing a party hat and desperately trying to summon the strength required to pull both ends of a cracker. 
two points to Andrew. And at the end of round one, the scores are Susan and Michael have four, but Zoe and Andrew have five. <laughs> we start round two with an engagement announcement in The Telegraph. The engagement is announced between Kit, son of Mr and Mrs Nicholas Akers, and Cat, elder daughter of Mr and Mrs Bart Stevens. <laughs> to Bruce Fleming for sending us that piece of laughably good news. Susan, have a listen to this. A very strange reaction. The more I see, the more I do. So oh, prefer the Grandmaster Flash version myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Susan, who's been accused of forgetting their lines? This is actually quite a, a worrying story, I, I think. Um, some research has shown that apparently if you remove the white lines from roads, people drive more safely. Uh, the AA disagree with this, but a council in Norfolk are petitioning the council to remove the road markings uh, from the roads, the principle being that if there are no road markings, everyone drives more slowly because they don't know where the markings are because somebody's taken them away. <laughs> now, personally speaking, I like to be told what to do. It's why I like Angela Merkel. I like a force. <laughs> I, like I like to know what the, what the rules are, where I'm meant to be and when I'm meant to stop. Well, I suppose like, a lot of country lanes already have no markings on them. I don't drive down them. I'm a town person. <laughs> the countryside frightens me. If I'm more than five minutes from a shop, I, I have a panic attack. <laughs> You've taken away white lines as an indicator of where you are and found that people drive slower and more cautiously. But using that as a sort of rule of thumb should make people just close their eyes while they're driving as well. <laughs> Drive slower and even more cautiously. Yes, if everyone had slightly mistier windscreens, yes. presumably they'd be a little bit more cautious. Yeah. Yeah. I, I live close, I don't live in the countryside, but I live in a town, but I drive the countryside a lot to take my children to school, and people already, on a, there are lane markings that are completely ignored. I fail to see the other situations can be improved by there being no sort of demarcation because whatsoever. It, if we start with that, where will we be, Miles? If the country folk take over our town ways, <laughs> then before we know it, we'll oh, all be Oh, people will be selling you ferrets in pubs and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, for one, want those country people to come up to the city and hunt the fox that keeps opening my green bin every night. <laughs> what, what, what is, your, is your green bin a recycling bin? Is it garden waste Yes, bin? it's a green recycling bin. I'm very fond of chicken, but I don't eat the bones for obvious reason. I'm not a lunatic. <laughs> Therefore, they have to be recycled. But for a fox, delicious, tantalising. Yes, he keeps kicking over my bin. Then there's dietary. He's kicking pain. over the bin. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course I he's... Think, he, I, don't he, think he, I don't think a fox is kicking <laughs> over the bin. What's happened what, is what? he's driving up to your bin, there's no white line, and he's just smashed <laughs> straight into the bin. I had, I had the displeasure uh, a couple of months back of a sleepless night listening to two foxes getting down and dirty at the end of my garden. <laughs> Has anybody ever heard the lovemaking of the fox? Yes. Not entirely consensual. <laughs> One of them foxes needs to hide in a Latin American embassy, if you ask me. <laughs> Precariously, this is the story that central white lines have been removed from a number of UK roads after research said that doing so makes vehicle speeds reduced by 13%. If there's one thing that will really spice up the already thrilling experience of meeting a car going at 60 around a blind corner on a rural road, it's them being on the wrong side. <laughs> You're playing with fire getting rid of the white lines, though. We all remember the controversy when the A303 blacked up in the early 90s. <laughs> Tracy Jessup, Norfolk's Assistant Director for Transport, and let's face it, you don't get that position without knowing what's what, <laughs> said, in most cases, we've seen some positive impacts on the road. <laughs> Two points to Susan. Michael, who's finally got what they were looking for? Uh, well, I'm going to guess that that might be... <laughs> 
Lord Lucan, perhaps? <laughs> uh, he, has been, uh, he has been missing since, I think, 1974, um, and, but he was never found, and now he's officially dead, a death certificate has been granted. And yeah, he, he was never found, although there were an awful lot of sightings of him. Weirdly, they were all around the world. I, I read a list of them. It was, um, he supposedly, down the years, been seen in Australia, France, Paraguay, San Francisco, parts of Africa. I'm looking at a list of countries, and I'm thinking, did anyone ever conclusively rule out the possibility that for 42 years he's just been working on a cruise ship? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't he in um, uh, Zambia? That's think- where he was. Well, there was a sighting of him there, or you there was happened a lot to know of that he was there. there. I mean, through the years, that's where he was. I mean, any, you know, the broad... Definitively, broadsheet... that's where he well, was. It's was, it was quite it was a big fact to suddenly lay down for I, t- <laughs> I just think this is a tremendous coincidence coming the same week as the Julian Assange news. I'm prepared to bet five pounds. Five pounds, when the door opens and uh, Assange says he's leaving, Lord Lucan actually walks out. We'll be like, wow! <laughs> That, and then the camera will just pan up to the balcony and David Blaine will be there going, yeah. <laughs> Presumably, in the old days of journalism, when there was a lot more money about, then it would be really great news, wouldn't it, if there was a loop mm. inside? If you were working mm. for, a, you know, somewhere mm. on Fleet Street and you could think, you go, God, it's tedious. Oh, I, I tell you what, I'll go and tell them there's been a sort of Lucan sighting in Provence. <laughs> <laughs> We, we just don't have the budgets now, though, so now we, we just have to sit at our desks and produce 42 top times that Lord Lucan reminded us of Harry Potter or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, astoundingly, Lord Lucan is dead. His death certificate was confirmed this week, 41 years after he disappeared from a murder scene, allowing his son to inherit what is surely a somewhat tarnished brand. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a horse in Ireland waiting to find out if it will finally inherit the title of Shergar. <laughs> You can understand why they've waited till now. If Matt LeBlanc hosting Top Gear isn't going to flush him out of hiding, nothing will. (laughs) Of course, the person I feel sorry for is Elton John, having to once again rework the lyrics to Candle in the Wind. (laughs) (laughs) No, I, I think we can say with great certainty that after 41 years, Lord Lucan is definitely dead. Our thanks to Lord Lucan for sending that one in. Two points to Michael. Zoe, who's feeling teed off? Uh, This is Wentworth Golf Course, which is a very uh, famous golf course in Surrey. And uh, it has been purchased recently by a Chinese-based company who have now rather dramatically increased the uh, annual fee to joining, for the joining of the club. Um, there is now a £100,000 fee that has to be paid if you initially want to join the club, and then the annual fees have been increased to £16,000 a year. I love this story because some of the golf club members are up in arms, obviously, about this, because they feel they're being cheated out of their membership to a club that they love and, and enjoy going to. And the other members have welcomed it with open arms because they obviously feel that certain members are a little bit riffy-raffy, if you don't mind. <laughs> and it finally gets rid of them. So Wentworth Golf Club was already a very sort of elite establishment, and now it's become mega-elite. And the, what, those that are going to be invited to rejoin the club are quite happy about this, but those that have dropped off the bottom have suddenly gone, oh, right, we don't quite make the grade anymore. This is... I mean, it's fine being... Uh, it's, it's, it's fine not allowing the riffraff in until you become the riffraff. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone on the panel play golf? Nope. I used to... Oh, God, Andrew. <laughs> Still no fact, some of the best saunas in this country. <laughs> uh, no, look, my, the only thing I've ever done, and uh, it, as far as the, the very small ball, the very small hole, and the sticks and stuff is, and I cannot recommend this enough, if you're ever in Edinburgh, get yourself over to the meadows, right? And on the edge of the meadows, there is, at one end of it, there's a pub. And you can go into that pub, and you can give them a fiver over the bar, they'll give you the two sticks and a bunch of balls, and you just go around the course, and it's about 38,000 holes. <laughs> it takes hours and hours, and you're always very close to the pub if you want to quit for a bit. Andrew, it's just a pitch and putt. <laughs> Have you just been going round and round a pitch and putt for hours because you're drunk? Yep, but you, can, <laughs> but you can do it with a girl, and that's what I like. <laughs> 
<laughs> Smashing. Um, well, uh, concurrently, this is the shocking news that members of Wentworth Golf Club don't like the Chinese. And today's reason <laughs> is because China-based club owners Rainwood are planning to charge them a one-off fee of £100,000 to stay members and then hike their annual fees from eight to £16,000. Wentworth members say that the club is at the heart of a vibrant and diverse community and they have to have somewhere to hide from it. <laughs> It must have come as a terrible shock to these people to come face to face with the consequences of the unfettered capitalism they have worked all their lives to perpetuate. <laughs> right on, comrades. <laughs> this could result in the moving of the Wentworth PGA Championship, which The Telegraph described as a doomsday scenario. <laughs> Well, we always knew the end had to come, but from such an unexpected quarter, who knew? Say what you like about China, but be quick. We've probably got about six months tops. Um, <laughs> two points to Zoe. Before we reveal the final scores, has anybody got a cutting they'd like to share? Susan. This is a job advert spotted by Deb Slate and Amy in West Dorset. Evershot Farms is looking for someone to relieve our shepherd every other weekend. <laughs> Michael. Uh, this is an advert spotted by Dan Bloomer, and it's from a website called Hot UK Deals. Show the wife you love her. Valentine card. Only 7p at Asda. <laughs> Zoe. Um, this is from the BBC News website, sent in by Will Panel. Um, a man who illegally parked in a disabled space outside a court while he was inside admitting illegally parking in a disabled space <laughs> has been fined. <laughs> Thank you. And now let's take a look at the final score. Susan and Michael have eight, but tonight's winners are Zoe and Andrew with nine. Before we leave you, here is a cutting from the Evesham Journal, sent in by Andrew Dermont and Amy Gray. Two fire engines were deployed to a farm following a report that a cow was stuck in mud up to its belly. Firefighters approached the animal, who got up and walked off. <laughs> a spokesman for the Fire and Rescue Service said it appeared that the animal had been lying down. <laughs> With that, goodbye. Taking part in the news quiz were Susan Kalman, Michael Deacon, Zoe Lyons, and Andrew Maxwell. In the chair was Miles Jupp, and the news was read by me, Corey Caulfield. The chair's script was written by Max Davis, Gareth Quinn, and James Cattle, with additional material by Sarah Campbell and Athena Kuklenu. The producer was Richard Morris, and it was a BBC Radio comedy production.